So medications. So like I said, there are three medications that are approved by the, uh, the FDA for uh, opioid addiction. And um, they, there's three different types of medications. You've got something called an agonist, which produces opioid effects, like similar to the, the illicit opioid being used. Partial agonists sort of have like a mixed effect. They have, they're sort of, they're another term for a partial agonist is a mixed agonist antagonist, where they have, they produce moderate effects to a certain extent, and then the effects don't get any greater. And then you've got antagonists, which is sort of the flip side of an agonist, which blocks the effects of an opioid. So what does that mean? Well, I'm going to show you. So you have this little handy dandy graph where you've got your different types of medications. So in looking at first a full agonist, so something like methadone, you have this dose response, right? Dose dependent response. So the more you take, the greater an effect you have, right? Opiate effect is on the y-axis and the dose is on the, on the x-axis. So the more methadone you take, the greater the opioid effect is going to be. To the point where if you take too much, you have respiratory depression and, and possible death, right? So the more you take, the more of an effect you get. On the flip side, so, so if you think about, I have a, a little like metaphor for you. So if you think about, how many of you have heard the lock and key metaphor when we, when we talk about this? No? No one? Okay. So in, in this metaphor, you've got, uh, it's like having a, a, a locked door. And with an agonist, a full agonist is like having the right key to the door. So you stick the key into the doorknob, you turn the doorknob and the door opens completely with no restriction, right? The door just wide, goes wide open. So it's having the right key to fit into that lock and open the door. If you think about the lock as the, the receptor, right, the opioid receptor, so it would be like having the right key to the right lock, you open the door, and the more, you know, the wider you open the door, the wider it goes, the more of an effect you have. On the flip side, you have an antagonist, which, remember, is the, it blocks the effects of the opioids. So naloxone or Narcan is an example of an antagonist. What happens when you give someone who's experiencing opiate overdose a shot of Narcan? What happens to them? Withdrawal. Like the movie, anyone see the movie Pulp Fiction? When he jabs the shot of Narcan into the girl's heart, what happens to her? She wakes up and she's pissed, right? Because it throws, it throws you into f withdrawal. It, it, ta it takes, it, it, what happens is if she had, it was heroin, right? So she had heroin on board, gave her a shot of Narcan, then the Narcan replaced the heroin in the opioid receptor and threw her into full blown withdrawal, right? So she wakes up and she's mad because you just wasted her high, right? And, and that's true of a lot of, a lot of like with, with Narcan is that people get mad when you like use it because you just wasted their money. Like you just took them out of it being high. Although you really saved their lives because they would have died if you didn't do that. So, so an antagonist blocks the effects. But if you have an, an, an agonist on board, if you have heroin on board or you have another um, opioid on board, it kicks that opioid, the agonist, out of the receptor and then it blocks any other opioids from coming in. So if you're, if you're taking something like naltrexone, which is an antagonist, I'll tell you, Vivitrol is an example of an antagonist. If, you t if you're taking Vivitrol once a month by injection and you try to use an opioid, nothing's going to happen, right? Because that opioid, the blocker is in the receptor and it's not allowing any other opioids to, to have an effect. So if you think about the lock and key, it's like having the wrong key to the door. So you can stick the key into the doorknob, but you can't turn the knob, right? So you can't open that door until you remove the wrong key and then you put a right key in. So it's like having the wrong key to the door. And then you've got this guy in the middle. So you've got the middle of the road partial agonist, which an example of is buprenorphine, right? So buprenorphine is a partial agonist. So at low doses, at low to moderate doses, a partial agonist acts just like a full agonist. So you do get opioid effects at low to moderate doses. But what happens is at a certain dose, you get this ceiling effect. So that if you take more, you're not going to get more of an effect. So as, so as you compare buprenorphine to methadone, the safety profile is better with buprenorphine because of the ceiling effect, right? You can't 
you're, you have, you're less likely to overdose from buprenorphine than you are from methadone because it's, you stop having an effect at a certain dose. So if you think about the lock and key metaphor, it's like having the right key to the lock, but the chain is on the door, right? So you can turn the key, I mean, you can turn the doorknob, and you could open the door, but only so much, because the chain's on the door. You can't open it all the way. So I find that very helpful to keep all this stuff straight, because it, it can like fry, fry your, it could like fry your brain. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about all three. So we're going to start, we're going to go from, we're going to go from agonist to partial agonist to antagonist. So we're going to start with methadone, go to buprenorphine, and end with naltrexone. Methadone has been around the longest of the three. It's been around since the 60s. And it is the w most, I mean, you saw before, it's the most widely used medication right now with um, opioid users, opioid addicts. Um, it also, it's, it's got indications for, um, you, you can use it to um, detoxify someone from an opioid or maintain someone, right? So there's sort of, it's two different approaches, either, you know, withdrawing someone from their illicit opioid or maintaining them on the medication to prevent the compulsive use associated with the illicit opioid, whether it's heroin or, or a prescription um, opioid. So in methadone maintenance programs or OTPs, it's, um, it's a liquid. You, it's, it's a, you dose by using a liquid. So you have like a dosing nurse. You have a window where you get your dose. The nurse watches you take the dose and then observes whether or not you've swallowed the dose of methadone to try to prevent diversion. Um, it, methadone's also used for pain, um, but that's a tablet formula, uh, a pill formulation of methadone. Um, the methadone that's used in OTPs is the liquid. It's been around since the 60s, and in California, it's covered by Medicaid. So we already talked about this, right? So the higher the dose you take, the more of an effect you get. So it really depends. Like, what dose you're on of methadone depends on the chronicity of your use. So, like, how long and what like how long were you using, um, how frequently were you using, and it also depends on what sort of dose of illicit opioid you were using. So you have a doctor who determines the dose based on sort of your history of, of your illicit opioid use. So it's a full agonist, so it binds the same receptors, it binds to those mu receptors, um, just like the heroin does or just like the other opioids. Um, it's, um, now, the reason why uh, when, you're, when you use this as a maintenance agent, the you still get some opioid effects, so you stave off withdrawal symptoms, and you prevent that rush, that euphoria, because methadone is slow, to, it's, a, it's got a slow onset, so it doesn't, it's not like an automatic rush the way that methadone, or the way that heroin is, and it lasts for a long time. So with heroin, how often do you have to redose? I mean, it really depends, but like, can, you, can a dose of heroin hold you for 24 hours? No, not, 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 not generally. Methadone can last for a long time. So it allows for, for, for daily dosing, um, and then it's got a slow offset. So it's not, you don't have to repeatedly dose throughout the course of a day. Um, it, you, can, you can use it in sort of a, in sort of a, 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 daily, a, a daily dose. What does the research say? It's the most studied medication. Uh, Walter Ling, who is our um, retired director of UCLA ISAP, was involved in many of the, uh, of the trials that were done for methadone. He's sort of one of the godfathers of, of um, opioid medication research, and um, it is the most studied medication for opioid addiction. Um, and it's got, it has a lot of positive effects. So if you look at death rate, there's been an eight to tenfold reduction in people dying from opioid uh, with, uh, overdose. It reduces use of, of illicit opioids while you're receiving methadone. It sort of, per, like I said, it prevents you from going into withdrawal and it sort of um, allows you to have a job, get back in touch with your family, be a tax, you know, be a taxpayer. Like the, it allows you to lead a productive life without that compulsive behavior of chasing the next high. Reduces crime, um, improves family and social functioning, increases the likelihood of employment. A lot of uh, methadone programs open really early in the morning. Like, I think they open at like 5 a.m. So you can go get a dose, you can go get dosed and then you can go to work for, for the day. Um, there's been improvements in physical and mental health and it helps to reduce the spread of HIV. What they're doing in Vietnam is opening methadone treatment programs to reduce the spread of HIV among injection drug users. And um, there, is sort, there is no, like I know a lot of times people ask, well, how long do you need to be on it in order 
like for it, like how, can you go off of it after a certain time? It depends. It depends on the individual user. Um, there are there are folks who have been maintained on methadone for a very long time and are doing and are doing well. There's other folks who take it for short times and then cycle back two years. You know, they they go through sort of a cycle of methadone maintenance, illicit use, methadone maintenance, et cetera. In terms of uh, if you look at the dropout rate um, from methadone treatment, or, I'm sorry, if you look at the relapse to IV drug use after you've left methadone treatment. So if you're in treatment, rates of injection are low, lower, around 28, under 30 percent. And then the longer you're out of treatment, the more likely you are to relapse to injection drug use. And it, it's just sort of, it's, this is a standard, we see this across research trials. So in 10 to 12 months after leaving methadone maintenance treatment, more than 8 in, of 10 of the folks are back to injecting. So it's near, it's, it's pretty close to being near universal relapse if you leave methadone treatment. Yeah, Susan. So Susan, Susan's asking, is, is this if you're only on methadone and not receiving any psychosocial sort of treatment? Do you know with this particular study? I don't remember with this particular study that have been done with use of methadone and with use of buprenorphine. And all of the medicines say you should be getting good psychosocial treatment. So the research is generally done on a platform of cognitive behavioral therapy. So that's, that's what we're comparing um, our data to. However, and controversially, there's some indication that in that combination, the medicine is the most important. So if someone refuses to get behavioral treatment, giving them the medicine still helps them meet many of the treatment goals that we would want to see, and it keeps them engaged with the treatment system so that we have continue, a chance to continue to work with them and hopefully draw them back into psychosocial treatment. But the data that Beth is showing you says, if we discharge them, because they don't want to participate in our psychosocial treatment, they're likely to go back to IV drug use, they're likely to overdose, they're likely to die. And that is, those are very common outcomes once someone leaves treatment with these um, medicines. And so psychosocial treatment is important, and it's how the research is done, it's how the medicines are labeled. But we need to think about the overall treatment plan and what our goals are when we craft out what we're going to do with an individual patient. Good question, Susan. Any other questions about methadone? Yeah. So the question is, at the, if, if the decision is made to stop taking methadone, do you just stop taking it or do you taper off? That is a decision that's made between the medical provider and the patient, and you absolutely don't just stop taking it. You, there is, a taper, there is a, a taper that you would go through, that, so you slowly decrease the dose of the methadone until you're down to zero. Um, it would be very dangerous to just stop using, which is why some people you know, leave methadone and they die, because... Then they go out. They have, you know, they they go out and use their illicit opiate, and then they're they're dead. So there is there is definitely a taper, um, and there's been some research looking at like a variety of taper schedules, and and it really is a decision that the provider, the prescriber, needs to make with the patient. Great question. Okay, so methadone. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, it's, it really is person dependent as to how long you stay on methadone, but the thought is if you're taking methadone you're, and not using illicit opioids, you can maintain on methadone for a very long time. There is like, there's no label, right Tom, there's no like, there's nothing in the label of methadone to say like that two years is the magic time frame or but I want to make sure I understand your question because the relapse rates that are on the slide up there are after they've been discharged from treatment. So it's months out after of discharge. treatment where they end up going back to injection drug use. And in fact, across study after study after study, the most common outcome of what we call detox, medically assisted withdrawal, is return to use. 
And so we, we very often say someone needs detox, we force them through the detox, we get them to an opioid-free state, we set them free, and they go back to using. Because as Walter, who Beth mentioned earlier, says, detox is good for lots of things, but keeping people off of drugs is not one of them. And so we really need to evaluate when does that withdrawal occur, and what are the indicators that it's not working, which means we need to restabilize, figure out what's not working, give them good psychosocial supports, and try it again when it makes sense to try it again. Good, good questions. Was there another hand, or were you just helping to get my attention? Okay. So moving on. So talking next about buprenorphine, which is our partial agonist. So um, again, similar to methadone, um, it helps the patient to uh, function normally without those cravings and without going into withdrawal. Because remember, at low to moderate doses, it has those, those reinforcing, those mildly reinforcing effects um, that you would get from your illicit substance without the compulsive behaviors that are associated with it. So it's, it's, it's strong, it, it binds very strongly to the mu opiate receptor. And um, it stays there for a long time. So if you, are, if you are receiving, if you are prescribed buprenorphine and then you try to take an illicit opiate on top of it, it's not going to, like the, the buprenorphine is going to block the effects of other, of other opioids that are ingested. It's got that ceiling effect at high doses, so it's considered to have a better safety profile than methadone or other full agonists. And, and really what happened is when, um, when buprenorphine came onto the market, it really, ex I said this before and I'll just repeat it, it, it expanded the, um, it sort of expanded people's options. So it's, you know, for some folks, methadone is the, is the treatment of choice. For other folks, buprenorphine is the treatment of choice. And what the, the difference in the two medications is that buprenorphine can be prescribed by a physician in private practice, whereas methadone can only be prescribed out of an, a licensed opioid treatment program. So for some folks, you know, there's still stigma, right? Like, it's, it's hard to open a methadone program in a lot of neighborhoods because it's that, NAM, that NIMBY, like, not in my backyard kind of thing. I don't want those people hanging out in my neighborhood. So... Um, there's this huge stigma still with methadone that you don't see with buprenorphine because Dr. Shaw, who works in the neighborhood, has his patients coming in and he's prescribing them in his private practice. So it expanded options for some folks who um, did not wish to go through a, you know, a methadone program. Um, and it's got, you know, I told you about how there's this uh, eight-hour training requirement to get the waiver on your license. Um, the label for buprenorphine states that the physician has to have the capacity to refer. To for psychosocial treatment. It doesn't mean that it happens all the time. Some, um, we're, we're trying to do a lot of work educating physicians of the folks like you who are out in the community who they can refer to. They just don't know, so they don't. Um, so they have to have the capacity re to refer if, um, if the person is willing to accept a referral for psychosocial treatment. So um, when it was first uh, approved by the FDA, uh, Reckitt Benckiser had the exclusive rights to it, and they were, for, they were marketing um, a, a, a mono and a combo product. Mono, what I mean by mono product, it was buprenorphine by itself. The combo product was buprenorphine and naloxone, right? Na, what's naloxone? Narcan, right, the, the overdose antidote. Um, and it's sort of as a ratio, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. So there was this combo product, and the whole reason for having marketing this combo product was to reduce diversion or reduce the chance for, yeah, to reduce the chance for diversion. Because naloxone, remember, is an antagonist, right? So by having this combo product, you're reducing the chances. They were thinking, they, they thought that you would re reduce the chance of diversion. So currently, on the, so there, so that there's, the exclusive rights expired a few years ago, so now there's generic formulations of buprenorphine on the market. They're cheaper. They're definitely less expensive than, um, than um, Suboxone and Subutex were, which were the two sort of name brands of the initial products. And now we've got, um, under brand, still under brand name, we've got two different combo products. You've got something called a Suboxone. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention is these products initially were um, tablets that you put under, your, they, they were sublingual tablets. So you put them under your tongue and they dissolved sublingually. That was the indicated route of exposure. You didn't, swallow, you didn't chew them, you didn't swallow them. You put them under your tongue and they dissolved sublingually. 
Um, there were some issues with uh, young kids getting their hands on the tablets and having and getting into trouble. So, Rekha Kieser came up with a film which was less sort of it had less of a chance of, um, of, of impacting folks who shouldn't have been taking it. And then there's also this new one called Zubsolve, which is a, is, all, is a sublingual tablet, but it's at like different, it's at like funky doses, like the, the dosages are different. And Tom and I talked to one of our psychiatrists, psychiatrist colleagues at UCLA, and we said like, what's the uptake with this? And she said, not very good, because it's like weird doses and it's just, it hasn't been, it's not being used as much as the film formulation is. But the way that it works, you see with Suboxone, which is the combo product, the buprenorphine naloxone product, it's a four to one ratio of buprenorphine to naloxone. So for every four milligrams of buprenorphine, there's a milligram of naloxone, right? So it's a four to one ratio of, of um, the partial agonist to the antagonist. There's some stuff in the pipeline that's still under, um, under review and still undergoing some clinical trials. One of them is, a, is an implant. So similar to like Depo Provera, where you would implant it under the skin, it would be good for six months. So you'd only have to be dosed twice a year. There's lots of questions though about who's gonna administer it. How are you gonna follow up? Like how are you gonna assure that medical follow-up will occur? And then how are you gonna provide behavioral therapy if you're only gonna see a person twice a year, right? So lots of good questions. And then there's an injection. Oh, wait, was I? That's the one that's like Depo, right? The implant? Norplant. I'm sorry. Nor I meant Norplant, not Depo. Um, and then there's also um, something called bro probufine, which is an injection, kind of similar to like uh, to Vivitrol, where you inject Vivitrol once a month. There's a buprenorphine injection that would be good for a month. But again, like if you're only going to see someone once a month, how do you assure that that psychosocial treatment is being provided? So those aren't approved yet. We'll see. We'll see, you know, what happens down the line. So this combo product, so the, the, this buprenorphine plus naloxone, um, it's got that four to one ratio. And if you take it as prescribed, which is sublingually under your tongue, you won't have the naloxone. You won't have the antagonist effects at all. You'll have the buprenorphine effects. If you inject it, something very different happens. And I'll tell you what that is in just a minute. So you've got this um, like sublingual versus injection um, bioavailability and potency. So those are big words. Um, so buprenorphine in the combo product, you're not going to get 100% of any medication you take, right? Some of it's not going to be absorbed into your system. It's going to kind of just be, you know, recycled and passed through. Um, but what you get when you take the combo product sublingually under your tongue, you get 40 to like so you get 40 to 60% of the buprenorphine effects, but only like 10% or less of the naloxone effects. So you get the opioid agonist part of the medication, not the antagonist part. If you inject it, which some people try to do, the buprenorphine, if you inject it, is two times stronger. So you'll get like a, a double, like it'll feel like a double dose of bup. The naloxone is 15 times stronger. So what's going to happen if you inject the combo product? You're going to go into withdrawal, like full-blown withdrawal, very quickly, exactly. So this is really meant to, 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 to um, decrease the chances of injection. And there were, um, what was it, France, Tom, where there was, like, initially there were some issues with, with injecting buprenorphine? Injecting buprenorphine specifically along with injectable uh, uh, high doses of benzodiazepines. Mm -hmm. And that they, they were having an additive effect, which was leading to overdoses using buprenorphine. Uh, and so they wanted to prevent that, obviously, if it was going to be widely available in this country. So the, the combo product is really the focus of marketing in this country uh, for the reasons of that. So, uh, hold that thought for one second. Or, uh, go ahead. Is naloxone a drug to which one can build up tolerance over time? No. Right? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay, so uh, what does the research say? So buprenorphine it has been shown to be as effective as a moderate dose of methadone. Um, and in, this, is, this is what we call a no-duh statistic. In one study, I think Keiko is the lead author, after a year of buprenorphine plus psychosocial counseling, three-quarters of the patients were retained in treatment versus none in the placebo. 
like, shocker, yeah, like the medication's helping retain people in treatment. Any questions about buprenorphine? Oh, pretty straightforward. So ending with naltrexone. Naltrexone um, initially was uh, developed for alcohol, and then it was more recently um, approved for the use uh, in uh, opioid addiction. It's an antagonist, right? So it's a blocker. And how it works is by this pretty little picture on the right. So you've got your neuron. This is your postsynaptic nerve cell neuron. And you've got these little guys that are your opioid receptors. So what happens is naltrexone binds to the, the opioid receptors and blocks the opioid from having an effect. So this could be heroin, this could be oxy, this could be Vicodin. So it blocks it from having an effect. So basically what happens is you take the party out of the pill or you take the party out of the heroin, right? Because if you take heroin, if you are, on, if you are receiving naltrexone and you take heroin or you drink alcohol, nothing's going to happen. So it takes away those reinforcing effects of the opioid. And the thought is that if it's no longer fun, you're not going to do it, right? So it's um, what, like, yeah, it's like they, they, with alcohol users who use it, it's like taking the party out of the bottle because it, you, don't get, you don't get drunk anymore. So um, initially it was marketed as oral tablets, so by Depaid and Rev Revia. Naltrexone is, ex I mean, Vivitrol is the extended release version of naltrexone. It's an intramuscular injection in your, in your tush uh, once a month. So you get an injection in your butt, and it lasts for a month. Um, and I think in LA County, Tom, with the criminal justice folks, they're getting three dose, like three months worth of Vivitrol when they're released from, from jail. Yeah. Um, so that's the story with Vivitrol. Um, so I said already it's been shown to be effective for both opioid and alcohol addiction. There has been um, redu reductions in risk of re-imprisonment by using it. Um, it lowers the risk of opioid use, whether or not you're getting additional psychological support. And um, the one thing with the tablet formulation of naltrexone, there were some compliance issues. Patients weren't taking it, right? Because why would you take it when it's not like letting you get high anymore? So the extended release version by getting an injection in your, in your, in your rear end for once a month, it lasts for a month. So for a whole month, you can't, if you take an opioid or you drink alcohol, it's not going to do anything. So, it, so the, the extended release version of naltrexone helps with compliance. Um, well tolerated, uh, associated with a significant abstinence rate. And then in this one study, it was a five-year uh, follow-up study, naltrexone plus behavioral therapy saw improvements in drug use, so less people use drugs, less people um, used dep other depressants, like so alcohol or other depressant medications, legal status improved, and psychiatric symptoms um, resolved. So strong evidence for all of the medications. Just in the interest of time, I want to go ahead and skip over the second case study. Um, just so you can see, though, it was we were going to talk a little bit more about um, this time it was a woman who was having unprotected sex, and yeah, she was positive for opioid in pregnancy. So this is going to be more of a referral case study, but I want to make sure I get to the, nal the naloxone stuff before we end. So this is just a public service announcement part of the, of the training, really talking about like the fact that these medications can help save lives. Um, I borrowed, I, I borrowed these, some of these slides from um, Wesley Clark, who was the former director of the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at, at SAMHSA. Um, and he, you know, part of his sort of recent presentations before he left CSAT uh, were all around, like, increasing access to medications. So it's all about, I mean, you all know, like, just from your daily work, uh, care coordination is very important when you have patients who are being prescribed medications for their alcohol or, or, or drug addiction and also receiving care for their HIV or for other primary care issues. So understanding the role, right, the only, the, the only provider who can, talk, who can truly talk to a patient about their medication use is the prescriber, right? So um, most people who are working in substance use treatment programs aren't, are, would be working outside their scope of practice if they were engaging in a conversation about medication use with their patients because they're not prescribers. But understanding how each person fits within the care continuum is, is super important. 
with, um, with the development of health neighborhoods and the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, we're, having, we're, getting, we're getting the opportunity to work with people we've never gotten to work with before because patients have choice, more choice now, and they're choosing where they want to seek their care. And if you're not going to provide them with comprehensive care, they're going to go somewhere else, right? So um, care coordination is very important when you're dealing with medication-assisted treatment. It's also important, especially when you're dealing with younger users, is just early, like early identification. The sooner you can catch them in their use history, the more likely they are to do better long term. So um, it's a progressive condition. The sooner you receive treatment, the better the outcomes are. Um, it's not always immediately apparent. Like the, the, you really have to look to see what some of the sort of the, hint, the hints are that, that, a, that a young person is using a, an opioid or heroin in particular. Um, so here are some things, that, and these are, these are general warning signs. It wouldn't just be heroin, but it could be other things. So changes, right? Obviously, these are pretty straightforward. Changes in friends, change in behavior, um, being sick a lot, lo losing the appetite, uh, either sleeping too much or nodding off, like at the dinner table. That would be a sign that something might be wrong. Um, being irritable or depressed, uh, having some blackouts, memory lapses, and money disappearing, either from your wallet or theirs, right? So money to get the to get access to the to the drugs so I want to talk a little bit about naloxone and how it can be so that's what I mean like overdose prevention at different phases in sort of a in a medication assisted treatment experience so you've got that initial induction induction is when you're it is when you're bringing someone on to the medication you're in, you're inducting them onto the methadone or the buprenorphine um, that's a that's a tricky time, right? Because in order to induct someone onto these medications, they have to be abstinent from the uh, from the opioid for a certain time frame. So they're at risk, right? They're at risk for going out and using and overdosing potentially. Um, so it's that it's a critical time frame where um, just being mindful that they're you know if if needed, you can use naloxone for um, for preventing the overdose while they're being induced onto the medication. Um, SAMHSA uh, developed an, opi an opioid overdose toolkit uh, back in August of 2003, so it's been around for about a year and a half, a little more than. Uh, this is, this, I have to update this, it's, there's probably well over 23,000 downloads, but it's a really straightforward, practical guide. It's got five modules, and it's for the community. It's for community members to learn about overdose uh, prevention opportunities. So it's for families, it's for first responders, it's for um, law enforcement, it's for prescribers, it's for the community at large, and it talks about strategies that you can use to prevent overdose and treat overdose. Um, this is a verse. This is an This is a version of the um, auto injector version of naloxone. It's called Evzio. Um, <clears throat> This is from about a year ago. There's also a um, there's also a nasal version of naloxone that you don't have to inject. You can just snort it up. Like you could just put it up. The, you know, it's up the person's nose. My uh, cousin is a cop in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, and he carries naloxone. He carries the um, the the, inha the the inhalant, the inhaler version, and he's had to use it like several times. He's had to help people who are um, experiencing overdose. So there's um, there's been some efforts. The Clinton Foundation, so Bill and Hillary Clinton have a foundation. Their, one of their missions is to decrease the cost of naloxone so that it becomes more widely available. There is also, there's been a lot of stuff in the media and in, in, they're in the news in California around increasing, like the Department of Public Health is trying really hard to increase the use of uh, naloxone as well. Um, another time someone talked about um, like tapering someone off of medication-assisted treatment, that would be another time, right, when someone would be very vulnerable to overdose because they're tapering off of the medication. If they went out and used an illicit opioid, they could, they could overdose. So it's kind of the same message that you would give, like, in terms of, of using naloxone as, a, um, as an agent in, in um, medication-assisted withdrawal as opposed to induction. Um, so it's really all about just, make, you know, getting the word out there about the importance of having the prescription and, and carrying it with you, right? Because if it's you're not going to have very long to save someone from overdosing. It's it's got to be like a split second decision. And um, I'll sort of end with this little this little nugget. So, a couple of years ago, the addiction the um, American Society of Addiction Medicine (ASAM) 
commissioned a report, and at that time, only 28 states were covering all three of the FDA-approved medications. California is one of them, one of the 28 that is. Um, but that's a problem because how, there's, there's 22 states that are not covering the cost. So access is a huge issue, right? Um, and uh, we have to sort of get beyond that and, and increase the availability so that more folks have access to it to, you know, to, to use it to their benefit. Um, and I thought this was particularly powerful. Um, and this was from a Pew, like P Pew is a think tank that they do surveys to see like what public opinion is. And basically in the coverage, in their coverage of this ASAM report, they said you wouldn't deprive a diabetic of insulin and you wouldn't hold back a statin from a patient with high cholesterol. So what the heck is the difference, right? Why would you withhold a medication from a heroin addict? Um, so really it's all about increasing access and affordability and getting rid of those barriers and that stigma that's out there. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, does anyone have any questions about the medications before we do your post test that you're all going to get 100% on, right? Because you were paying attention? Yeah. So the question is, would you recommend that residential providers provide naloxone yeah. to the patient or to like the family members? Yeah, there, there are efforts out there to, to explore doing that, like just getting folks access to naloxone so that if the person is discharged from residential and they're not discharged into a lower level of care, um, there is a risk that they're going to overdose, right? They're, they may go back out and use this, the same dose. So there, there are sort of multi-pronged efforts to educate the public around the, the, uh, the use of and availability of naloxone. I don't think it's happening like, I don't think it's happening routinely necessarily, but. Um, I think with opioid dependence, the data is fairly incontrovertible that medicines need to be involved. Uh, that when people don't get medicines, they generally aren't able to stop using. Uh, and so when you look at like residential treatment programs, there are many that have policies that say, if you're on methadone, you can't come into our treatment program. That's just medical malpractice at some point. Because what it says is the best possible treatment that we can give the person, we're going to deny you even though you need to be treated in this environment for all the, all the right reasons, according to ASAM criteria, et cetera, you can't get access to that because you also need a treatment that we don't believe in. Uh, and we, as a field, are gonna go through some really painful growing pains if some of the lawsuits I've heard about recently that are being filed come to fruition. There were some mental health lawsuits that were filed uh, when antidepressants were coming on board, and antidepressants were clearly the state of the art. The programs didn't, not all programs believed in them. Those, many of those programs are sued, and there's one landmark case that basically held financially liable a treatment program who didn't provide those services. Similar, similar lawsuits are being filed right now against drug treatment programs in the state of California using that case as precedent. They've all been settled with sealed results. Which, by the way, to me says the, the plaintiff, the people who are suing, won, and everyone agreed to keep it quiet, right? At some point, one's going to go to trial, and we're going to see a radical shift in that. So let's not wait for that. Let's figure out how we begin to adapt our systems now to give everyone the full benefit of all of the treatments that we have to offer according to the science, and less about our belief systems, uh, and more about what we know works. Yeah, question up front. Are you you cannot enter a detox program if you're on methadone 30 milligrams or over. And some people want to get detox, but they cannot mm -hmm. enter because they're above that. Right, they're 30 above the certain milligrams. Dose. Yeah. And I don't believe in that. Mm -hmm. That's a myth. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I totally forgot to say that. So method, that's a great question. So are these medications safe for pregnant women? Methadone is the gold standard. 
of medications to use while pregnant. Uh, and the thinking is that it's more dangerous to the mom and the unborn child if you, if you detox someone off of the illicit opioid that they're using than it is to induct them onto a medication. So, so methadone is the standard, the gold, sort of the gold standard. There was a study that was done called the mother study, and I can't for the life of me, I looked it up last night and it's, it's, I've lost it, what mother stands for. I can't remember, but it was an international study. It was a prospective study. So they enrolled women, pregnant women, in this trial, and they followed them for up to 28 days after they delivered, birth, delivered the baby. And they looked, at they looked at outcomes, both the outcomes to the mom and the baby, and they were comparing methadone to buprenorphine. What's the mother stand for? And human experimental research. Thank you. And it was it was three countries, right? The U.S., Australia. Ill. There was a third country. Uh, it was it was a relatively small trial. It wasn't like thousands of women, but they com they were comparing outcomes um, of methadone versus buprenorphine. They found that the the kind of the two major findings were that the outcomes of the women who were prescribed buprenorphine, the maternal and the like fetal outcomes were similar among the buprenorphine prescribed moms versus the methadone prescribed moms. But the big difference was that there was, a, there was less prevalence of neonatal abstinence syndrome. Does anyone know what, does everyone know what neonatal abstinence syndrome is? It's sort of a cluster of, um, a cluster of symptoms that impact the baby that's born like addicted to the opioids. So there's this cluster of, of symptoms that once the baby's born, he or she needs to be hospitalized until those symptoms resolve. So it's, an, it's a huge issue with opioid using pregnant moms when they deliver the babies. There's high incident, there's high rates of, neo, of NAS among these babies, especially in places like, like Kentucky and other states in that part of the country. There's, there's huge percentages of babies born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. It's dangerous for them to be born that way. Um, buprenorphine was less likely to be associated with neonatal abstinence syndrome than methadone was. So this, kind of, this, this study kind of introduced the idea that maybe buprenorphine is something that can be used in pregnancy as well as methadone. Tom. Just one point of clarification. Neonatal abstinence syndrome is certainly something that needs to be medically addressed if a baby is born opioid dependent. Detox during pregnancy is medically contraindicated. Right. Yeah meaning it is dangerous for the mother and the developing fetus um, to go through detox. So transition onto a long-acting opioid and then dealing with whatever happens after that is safer for both the mother and the developing fetus. Then it would be to detox the mom off of the heroin or whatever. That's exactly yeah. right. So thank you for, because that's, thank you. I totally forgot to mention that before. Other questions? Yeah, up front. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you want to see them? I didn't hear what came. Oh, the, the, her friend was taking methadone while pregnant, and the baby had d d defects when she when it was born. There's nothing that's been shown that has any teratogenic effects. Mm -hmm. So something went on in that pregnancy right. that led to those results, and. The condition may have been worsened by the baby being sick when it was born with neonatal abstinence syndrome, but I don't think we can connect those two stories together, at least without a lot of more information. She might have been uh, using drugs, mm -hmm. but she was taking methadone. Yeah, something else was going on, yeah. Other questions, comments, clarification? So um, I wanted to share with you some recommended reading and other resources. So there are lots of things out there available in the public domain, which means that your taxpayer dollars pay for them so you can get access them for free, that, are, that can be helpful if you want to learn more about some of the topics that we described today. So you've got um, something called TIP40. TIP stands for Treatment Improvement Protocol. There's a whole series of tips available through SAMHSA that are clinical, clinically focused, and they have there's a variety of topics. TIP40 is on is specifically on the of the use of buprenorphine in the treatment of opioid addiction. It's like gigantic. It's like this thick, and it's got 
tons of information. Tip 43 is, um, is more general, and it's medication-assisted treatment for opioid addiction in opioid treatment programs. So they've got that one. And then um, NIATEX, which is the Network for the Improvement of Addiction Treatment. They're an organization that works with uh, providers in a variety of settings to help improve um, access and engagement and treatment, access, engagement, and retention. They did a project with um, looking at um, using medication-assisted treatment in this one research effort called Advance and Recovery. So they were working with providers to incorporate medication-assisted treatment into their programming. So there's some interesting, this is good, this looks at like just lessons learned really. So it's, it's a practical, it's another practical guide. The um, Addiction Technology Transfer Center Network has, um, we had some funding, some supplemental funding a few years back from SAMHSA to develop a whole suite of products around um, increasing access of medications to ethnic, my, ethnic and racial and ethnic minority populations. So Tom and I developed uh, a couple of the, it's an, they're online courses available for free where um, if you want CE credit, there's a, a nominal charge, but there's some core, some core modules just around the use of medications. We talk about both the opioid medications and the alcohol medications. And then there's some um, population specific modules, like there's one on um, Asian Pacific Islanders, there's one on African Americans, there's one on Hispanic Latinos, and there's one on um, Native Americans and Alaskan Natives, which kind of provides the results of, um, of some uh, focus groups that we did all over the country around like what are the barriers to uptake of medications in racial and ethnic minority populations and what are the strategies that you can use to increase access in those populations. So there's lots of good information. And then lastly, there's something, um, there was an effort called the NIDA SAMHSA Blending Initiative, uh, which was an effort to um, speed up the uptake of research findings in the community. So Tom and I have um, led the development, well, Tom's been the lead on the development of four buprenorphine-related training products. Some of the information from those products is in this presentation. Um, but there's also products on motivational interviewing, uh, there's some on contingency management, there's one on um, smoking cessation, there's a new one on like technology-based um, treatment interventions. So if you're interested in, in some free, everything is free, so check it out. You can access them from that site. And then lastly, I had a couple of people ask me for copies of specific slides. So we said, at the beginning, this is a work in progress. It's a, I mean, it's a pretty decent work in progress, but there is still some work to do on it. So we won't publish the final draft of this probably until the summer. In the meantime, if you have questions or you want copies of specific slides, you can reach out to me by email. This is me, this first email, and I'll share them with you because I'm happy to. Um, but the full draft will be finalized by the summer and it'll be uh, disseminated by Phil and Maya It'll be disseminated by us. It'll be available all over the place. So we and what it'll include is the presentation with a fully articulated trainer guide. And the goal of that is that you take the slides and you use them. It's going to have notes. Every single slide is going to have notes that you can basically learn this content, and then you could do it in in services at your agency. You can teach your fellow, you know, clinicians about about what we're talking about. And then you've got Tom's email and Maya's email. And then you've got our website for the Pacific Southwest ATTC, and you've got the training calendar for the, um, the PAETC.